So in this video, I'm going to show you how to not build a cloud chamber. Let me explain. First, let me give you the brief rundown of what a cloud chamber is. All around us, there is ionizing radiation. It comes from the sun, it comes from outer space, and also the natural background radiation here on Earth. In some ways, it's mind-blowing to think that there's radiation all around us, and yet most people go about their everyday lives completely oblivious to the fact. Now, of course, we can't see ionizing radiation with our own eyes. But what we can do is make a cloud chamber which shows the trails left behind ionizing radiation. Now, the tutorial videos I watched online made it look really easy to build a cloud chamber. You just get some power to use, you get a big heat sink, you supply them with power, add some alcohol and a glass dome, and boom, you've got a cloud chamber and you're seeing ionizing radiation with your own eyes. However, my experience in building a cloud chamber has been anything but easy, simple, and straightforward. I think during the designing and building process, I've fallen into every possible trap and pitfall that you can when designing a cloud chamber. And that's why this video is called How Not to Build a Cloud Chamber, because I don't want anyone building a cloud chamber to go through the frustrations I've experienced when designing and building mine. Now, there will be a follow-up video I hope, of a working cloud chamber, and I don't want you thinking that this video is a waste of your time because there'll be a follow-up one. This video will have lots of relevant information that will lead on to the next video. So, let's get into how not to make a cloud chamber. Now, the key aspect in any cloud chamber is the cold plate, which needs to be below minus 25 degrees Celsius. Now, if you live in America, the cheapest method to achieve this is to simply go ahead and buy some dry ice. But if you live anywhere else in the world, that's probably not an option. So the next best option is to use these. This is a Peltier, or sometimes called a TEC. Now, when we supply power to the Peltier, heat gets transferred from one side of the tile to the other. And what this effectively means is one side gets very cold and one gets very hot. And if we stack three Peltiers on top of one another, we can get down to really cold temperatures, cold enough to make a cloud chamber. This is gonna be my cold plate. It is a piece of 1.2 millimeter thick sheet copper. And I've painted the top side satin black to reduce glare. These Peltiers produce a lot of heat and we need a method of dissipating that heat. So the obvious choice is a heat sink. I've got two very large heat sinks here. And I have tried both of these with my Peltiers, but they both these heat sinks failed to get me down to the temperatures I required. So I had to put those aside and go to a liquid cooling option. So this is a 140 millimeter radiator all-in-one computer liquid cooler. And I'm not going to be using one, I'm going to be using two. When it comes to choosing Peltiers and heat sinks, you've got to make your selections wisely. Whether you choose to go with an air cooler like I have here, or a liquid cooler like I'm using in my build, there is only so much heat that a heat sink or liquid cooler can transfer before the system is thermally overwhelmed and everything just gets heat soaked. A well-designed heat sink like this one or my liquid coolers can, in the ballpark, move around 150 to 200 watts of heat efficiently. Now each one of these Peltiers can generate 120 watts of heat, and that is a lot of heat to move, especially when you consider I'll be stacking three on top of one another. That can equal a huge amount of heat to dissipate. The first version of my cloud chamber I built, I only used one stack of Peltiers, and it failed to get me down to the temperatures I required. So that's why I'm using two coolers and two stacks of Peltiers in this build. So both the Peltiers and coolers need a 12 volt power source and the Peltiers draw quite a lot of current. So I've gone with a computer ATX power supply and I've modified it by removing all the unnecessary cables and connectors I don't need. There's only one green wire on the motherboard connector and I've extended that out. And when the green wire is connected to ground, a black wire, uh, the power supply switches on. And lastly, I added a mains cable to the back of the IEC connector here so that I can run a second power supply. So why do I need a second 12 volt power supply? 
Well, it's to run this. This is a high voltage step up or boost converter and it transforms 12 volts DC to over 20,000 volts DC on the output. Now if I ran this from my big power supply and an arc occurred, it could travel through the power supply, perhaps even through the coolers and destroy everything. So by running the high voltage boost converter from a, a separate smaller power supply, if an arc occurred, hopefully this is the only thing that gets damaged. So now I've got my parts worked out, I just need an enclosure to mount everything to. Hmm, wonder what I could use. As far as enclosures go, this is a pretty complex one to build. A uh, simple option would be to use either acrylic or plywood even. Right, let's get into the build. I cut these parts out of 3mm acrylic sheet. I use these M3 threaded knurl inserts with a soldering iron to melt the insert into the acrylic plastic. This is a great method for adding robust threads into plastics. Next I cut out two circles from some metal fly screen to fit my acrylic rings. One of these rings will be connected to the high voltage boost converter while the other will act as a holder for a sponge. I didn't like the shiny plastic look so I covered my acrylic plate with some matte black vinyl. Next I needed to glue the two tubes that form the uprights using acrylic cement. Once that cured, I glued the two rings onto the uprights. While that cures, I'll start mounting my high voltage converter into the enclosure along with my power supply. I 3D printed the standoff to insulate the power supply from the enclosure. The indicator LEDs and switches that turn on the Peltier's high voltage converter and lights were then wired in next. A wire was wrapped around one of the screws that secures the cold plate. Later this will be connected to the high voltage converter. It's a good idea to add some form of lighting into the chamber. I chose to use 12 volt LED strip lighting because it was easy to run directly from the power supply. I made this bracket to mount the LED strips to. The LED lights were then secured in place with screws. Before assembly I tested my peltiers and marked the hot side to avoid stacking them in the wrong order. Two peltiers are wired in series. This effectively runs them at half power. 
thermal compound is applied and the two Peltier's widened series are stacked on top of one another. A third Peltier is then added to the stack. This completes one stack and I'll be using two stacks for a combined total of six Peltier's. Thermal compound is used between the cold plate and Peltier's. Because my enclosure will have positive air pressure from the fans, I needed to use sealant around the Peltier's to prevent air turbulence inside the chamber. The connectors on my coolers were removed. We only need to connect 12 volts and ground to the pump and fan. The extra wires are used for RPM and PWM control which we won't be needing. Thermal compound was spread onto the Peltier's and the first cooler was fitted. Only I didn't get the head spacing right and thus didn't have adequate clamping pressure. So I swapped out the standoffs for some slightly shorter ones. Now I could attach both my coolers. Now let's take a moment to enjoy this beautiful masterpiece. Did someone say spaghetti junction? Now came the tricky affair of squeezing everything into the enclosure. Originally this enclosure was designed for only one stack of Peltiers and only one cooler, but that failed to get me down to the temps required for a cloud chamber, so here I am attempting to cram twice the amount of hardware into the same enclosure. Now the cold plate needs to be connected to the negative output of the high voltage converter. Remember that wire wrapped around the screw I added earlier in the build? This is where the negative high voltage wire is connected to. The positive high voltage wire is fed up through one of the acrylic tubes and through a hole in the side. It needs to be connected to the bottom mesh ring. I simply backed off one of the screws that secured the mesh and wrapped the wire around it, then retightened the screw. Next on the to-do list was to wire the Peltiers, LED lights and coolers into the power supply. And I'm sure you don't want to see me wire everything into the power supply for the next hour, do you? So let's just skip ahead. After weeks of prototyping and what felt like hundreds of tests, it came down to this moment. Would I break past the magical minus 25 Celsius threshold? Okay, well that might look like I failed, but what is preventing this getting colder is the buildup of ice forming on the cold plate. Once the glass dome is over top, the whole system should get another minus 5 degrees colder. Even though I made every effort to prevent the high voltage from arcing, it had total disobedience and arced anyway. So I swapped it out for a smaller unit. Rather annoyingly, both the output wires are coloured red, so I had no idea which one was positive or negative. I separated the wires far enough apart that they couldn't arc, but close enough to see the corona effect. You'll notice the wire on the right has more corona coming from it, so now I know this one is positive. I want to give a quick shout out to Noel Andrew. We've both been building cloud chambers and working through the issues associated with building one. He told me about using this method for identifying the polarity of high voltage sources. I used a buck converter to control how much voltage was supplied to the high voltage boost converter. It allowed me to fine tune the output voltage to a point where it no longer arced when installed into the chamber. Probably somewhere around 5 kilovolts. With that out of the way I could perform my first proper test run. I soaked a sponge with isopropyl alcohol and placed it on its holder. I used a ball of tack to hold the small button of americium salvaged from a smoke detector. It omits alpha and beta particles and provided it's handled properly is a fairly safe sample to handle. Not that I'm encouraging you to go out and pull apart smoke detectors. It's dangerous and without proper training can be deadly. Fortunately I'm a professional YouTuber with the proper training. So now it's just a matter of waiting a couple minutes to get down to temperature. You'll know when you're down at the right temperature when you start to see alcohol fog appear. I saw my first particle trails and I can't tell you how awesome this is to see in real life. But I did notice the effect wasn't as spectacular as other cloud chambers I've seen online. You'll notice the fog seems to be rolling off the sides of my cold plate. So I sealed the glass dome with tack and retested. Sadly it made no difference. It seems the alcohol fog is heavier than air and naturally wants to sink to the bottom of my chamber. 
Next I tried making a brim around the cold plate with more tack and retested. This time the trails were much clearer. I also noticed my LED lights were casting too much light on the cold plate for my liking. So I tried using a torch from the outside of the chamber to only cast light onto the alcohol vapour. And now we're really starting to see those trails pop out. Ok so let's review what's going on here. In my design the cold plate is elevated above the floor of the chamber, so let's use this alloy sheet as a stand in for my cold plate. The water is representing the alcohol vapour that floats just above the cold plate. Now because my cold plate is flat the vapours just simply slide off the sides, similar to what the water is doing here. But if I make my cold plate similar to this dish with sides, it will concentrate the vapours above the cold plate making the effect more visible. The question was how to add a lip around my cold plate, so it was back to the CNC mill where I machined out this mould. I applied soap as a releasing agent and filled the mould with polyurethane sealant and left it to cure for 24 hours. Once fully cured I removed it from the mould and cleaned up the edges. I used more sealant to glue it onto the cold plate. While that cures let's address my lighting issue. There are two issues with my design. The first is the top row of LEDs is too high and light is spilling onto the cold plate. Ideally you want the cold plate to be in darkness and only illuminate the alcohol fog floating just above the cold plate. Removing the top row of LEDs only offered a meagre improvement. My torch was still far better. Issue 2 is the type of light being projected from the LEDs. The LED strip I used is acting like a flood lamp. What I really need is a focused beam of light, so I opted for a very powerful Nichia 5mm LED mounted into a chrome bezel. Here we can see the LED has a focused beam of light projecting from it. Comparing the two side by side we can really see the difference. I 3D printed this on my printer to mount the LEDs to. I used two 330 ohm resistors wired in parallel to run each LED from a 12 volt power source. I mounted the LEDs into the chamber and fired up for a test run. Shortly after a disaster happened. The ISO alcohol had eaten the acrylic making it very brittle. Interestingly this only happened wherever there is a joint with acrylic cement. My assumption is the type of cement I used somehow allowed the alcohol to penetrate the acrylic and make it very brittle. So now unfortunately I'm facing a partial rebuild of my cloud chamber. I need to replace all the acrylic with a plastic that is more chemical resistant to isopropyl alcohol. So next time I'll be rebuilding with polycarbonate plastic. There's also several design changes to the chamber I want to make. I quickly realised having an elevated cold plate is a bad design, you get all sorts of weird air turbulences and you get the, f the alcohol fog sinking below the cold plate, not really ideal. Next time I want a cold plate that's on a flat plane with the bottom of the chamber. I've also learnt that using a sponge isn't as good as using a piece of thick felt to hold the alcohol. And also having a source of heat at the top of the chamber to evaporate the alcohol out of the felt is quite desirable too and that's actually what I was working on right at the moment that uh, my acrylic failed on me. So if you happen to have any experience in building cloud chambers and have a few suggestions of what I can do to improve the next one leave them down in the comment section below. Thank you very much for watching and if you found the video useful please give it a like it helps out massively. Other than that I'll see you in the next video with hopefully a working cloud chamber. Bye for now.